What's going on guys, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm back with another DM's Guild Spotlight video. This time, I have something a little bit different for you. This is the Joy of Monster Cooking. That's right, folks. This is an entire document module, if you will, here on the Dungeon Master's Guild that you can pick up for $1.95 that is all about cooking monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. So let's jump right over here to here's the page. Again, as always, two things. One... Link will be in the description if you want to pick up a copy for yourself. It is $1.95, so the goal is to give you guys some pieces of it, and then you make the decision on whether or not it's worth purchasing on your own. Um, let's see. It is currently rated five stars with six reviews. Uh, and this was gifted to me for review purposes by Lex Mandrake, the creator himself. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Lex, check out Dank Dungeons. I'll put links in the description to Dank Dungeons on YouTube and all social media and things like that. Um, but I know Lex through one of the players in one of my other games. But that's one that what this is about. This is about Joy of Monster Cooking. So let's see what it says here. Short and to the point here. Um, one of the hungry dungeon delver. Do not the greatest of warriors deserve the greatest of meals? Why let the carcass of that supernatural monster you just slew go to waste? Contained within are variant rules for cooking, new tool, chef's tools, a new sh background, the chef, two new magic items, and 18 almost real recipes, including soups, sauces, appetizers, and entrees. So what am I going to unveil to you guys? I'm going to probably show you the chef's tools utensils, as I think that that's pretty cool. The background I don't really think is important, as backgrounds are relatively fluid, in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition because you can just make up your own if you don't know there's a rule about it in the player's handbook about making up your own background to so the fact that that's so allowed that they let you do that in um, the Adventurers League so again I know that's not the end all be all but besides the point uh, two new magic items which I may reveal one and then I'll take a look at a couple of the recipes just to give you guys a taste pun intended of what you have to look forward to. So, let us jump into, here is the 22 page document of the joy of monster cooking. So, if we scroll down, um, we can see the layout. Forward, monsters we eat, the culinary arts, and then it's broken down into soups, sauces, appetizers, and entrees and dishes. So here's a nice little forward written explaining the thought process uh, behind the document, inspirations, etc. And then we have a section here called the monsters we eat so when you delve into the uh, deepest caverns the most ancient ruins you will encounter a multitude of powerful monsters often they lead to a very dead monster and an adventurers just burn through a lot of calories rather than letting the carcass rot um or attract scavengers why not replenish some of your energy problem lies in what parts from these monsters we can eat without incurring violent illness no one wants to sit down to a meal after a long fight only to be felled by your opponent after they're already dead Furthermore, what parts could possibly be beneficial to eat in more ways than just filling your stomach? And that's basically what this goes on to say. So if you look, we have a couple of monsters here highlighted in red. Basilisk, Beholder, Blight, Blet, uh, Chul, Coatl, Dragon, Goblin, Illithid, Kobold, Myconoid, Nothic, Orc, Owlbear, Pixie, Sahuagin, and Sturge. So some of these... I don't think are on un, like unreasonable right like maybe bullets blight made from plant but the interesting part about a lot of these I mean a chul is basically like a giant lobster so that makes sense but as you look through there's I'm not gonna go through any of the text here but a lot of these are intelligent races to the point where ah a word on intelligence and this is something I wanted to touch on where does one draw the line on eating intelligent creatures? We at the Joy of Monster Cooking do not presume to be your moral arbiters. What is right for one group might not be right for another. Some people draw the line at language. If it speaks, we don't eat it. Other people don't eat meat at all, preferring to live a vegetarian lifestyle. We advise that at the very least, you let your party know what you intend to cook before you serve them. Before you start cracking open orc skulls and carving out Nothic eyeballs, inform your party about the dish you intend to prepare and make sure they're comfortable eating it. The moral and dietary choices of your party come first above all. That said, let me explain our stance on the matter and the stance of this book. If you and your party had ultimately lost the fight against those orcs, those kobolds, that who again, what do you think those monsters would do? Those monsters would eat you, given the chance. And what do most of us do when we vanquish our foes? We usually leave them on the ground for the vultures to pick apart. 
look, you're going to be killing these creatures anyway, so why pretend that it's a mere righteous not to eat them, or is more righteous not to eat them given the chance? And knowing how delicious some of these creatures can be, it would be a waste to let them rot. We live in a dangerous world where the adventurer is always coyly dancing with death. Just one room over, just one wrong step, and your time is up. With your life constantly on the line, why would you want? Uh, why would you wait any longer to taste something new? Our sense of taste and the world of food are grand adventures, as intense and challenging as any dungeon, as tricky and complex as any wizard's tower. So why limit the tools you could use? Uh, you, you could use on these adventures. We're here to help you expand your palate, to open your taste buds to new possibilities, to give you the tools you'll need going forward, to get you ready for the epic adventure that is cuisine. And I felt it important to read that because. Uh, again, I'm not going to be going through every section of this document. I'm going to be giving you snippets, but I wanted to read that whole section just to show you the eloquence of the wording here. Uh, and I do actually, you know, it kind of just goes to show, and I like that it, it, it tiptoes around the intelligence thing, right? Because I feel like I know in my campaigns over time, a lot of people, if given the opportunity to say eat a dragon and have a dragon steak they will jump at the opportunity because that just sounds so metal and they want to do that but at the same time most dragons well, certain ones notwithstanding but most dragons are more intelligent than your party in a lot of cases so but people think people just have that weird toe in the line of like a dragon as a mindless creature versus a dragon as a highly intelligent in some cases spellcaster but I feel like orc and goblin, they're like, oh no, that's like eating a person. So it's borderline cannibalism, although it's not, unless you happen to be an orc or a goblin, but you get my point. So, all right, the culinary art. So we're going to talk about the chef's utensils and we're going to skip ahead a little bit. So variant rule cooking. When a player uses cook's utensils, they roll an ability check and add their proficiency bonus. Difficulty set by the DM. The rules set the DC for the ability roll to a static number, no matter what the meal is being or what meal is being cooked. Uh, we at the joy of monster cooking feel that if adventurer has already done the work of killing a powerful monster, they should not need to perform a difficult roll to enjoy the culinary benefits of that kill. However, we have built in high risk, high rewards for cooking. If the player rolls significantly below the target number, they do not only lose the magical effects of the dish, but also gain the poison condition for a period of time. Conversely. Player roll significantly above, they get additional healing. Um, and then you can see right here, DC 7 or less is gut-wrenching failure. Poison for the hour, or for one hour, provides no special effect. Tasteless but edible from 8 to 11 provides no special effect. Well-executed dish, uh, DC 12 to 17, works as described in the recipe. And a culinary masterpiece of an 18 or more works as described in recipe. Regain all HP on a short rest. Or all dice on a long rest. All hit dice on a long rest. And then we can see this new tool, Chef's Utensils. So written in the player's handbook are Cook's Utensils. This is Chef Utensils, two gold pieces. A simple set of Cook's Utensils can get you through preparation of mundane, everyday meals. But you, my friend, are anything but simple and mundane. You are a chef, a visionary, a culinary craftsman who demands only the sharpest knives and only the sturdiest of tools. So it goes into what your components are here. And it says, Intimidation, we chef. The, chef, the voice of a chef has an absolute authority in a kitchen. When cooking food or ordering others to do so, you have a formidable presence. You're used to cooks following your orders, uh, customers trusting you and your prowess, even if uh, taking risks, uh, even if it takes raising your voice, wow, from time to time. Insight, uh, a good chef can read a customer like an open book. When someone is eating food that you've prepared, you pick up on small ticks, gestures, and wording that might go unnoticed. Performance in your hands, a meal is not just nourishment, it's an event. When looking for a large, cooking for a large crowd, rather, you know how to please and impress everyone at the table. Nature, you're keenly aware of what kinds of produce are in season. You can tell what time of year a plant was harvested and the general location where it can be found. You also know which plants are edible, which aren't, and so on. History, you try countless types of dishes. Every plate tells a story. You can tell the cultural background of any given dish that you eat. And it says cantrips in the kitchen. Many adventurers have the ability to cast spells. Simple magics can be a huge boon for cooking. Cantrips such as prestidigitation or control flame can be a great effect when preparing meals. Control flame can be used to adjust the intensity of your cook fire on the fly, making it much easier to go from a boil to a simmer. Prestidigitation's ability to clean an object can make dealing with piles of used dishes, mixing, uten or mixing utensils, and measuring cups of breeze. 
Given that Precious Dictation is so versatile, some DMs may allow a caster to use it as a shortcut for other tasks such as prepping ingredients. And there's a chef background. Here's two new magical items. Uh, one's a magical ice box, and we can see the simple Scorch Tandor. I'm going to skip the magic items. There's only two. And we're going to roll into soups, right? So let's take a look at the uh, Bullet Bourguignon here. So, uh, and then there's, there's a little bit of lore here, which I like. Many years ago, I worked on a potato farm in the Highlands for a season. The farmer's beautifully... Uh, rugged older couple. The farmer is a beautifully rugged older couple with personalities carved by every mundane nuisance, every vicious winter that a commoner could face. Blah 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 blah. They eventually found me, eyes wide in utter shock for my life, hiding from the farm equipment and so on. You can see there's some interesting stuff here. And then here's the actual recipe. So again, this is written as though an actual recipe. Three pounds bullet shoulder and neck, cut into one inch pieces. Four onions thinly sliced. One pound cured pork, such as bacon or salt pork, cut into half inch matchsticks. Two tablespoons flour, two cups auroch stock. An auroch is uh, sort of like an ox, um, if you will. Uh, they, I believe they are listed in the back of Storm King's Thunder. Um, but yeah, they're basically like an, an ox type creature. So two cups auroch stock, three cups red wine, six carrots cut into one inch pieces. Three cloves, garlic, one bundle of herbs such as thyme, parsley, sage, two bay leaves, and salt and pepper. So first of all, a actual recipe. Then we get into how to cook it. Season the chunks of bullet meat on all sides with salt and pepper. Heat a large pot over a medium fire. Add the cured pork, cooking and stirring until the pork has rendered out most of its fat and has become crispy. Take out pork and set aside, making sure the party does not eat all of it before the meal is ready. Move the pot directly onto the coals. Add the meat chunks to the pork fat and sear until every piece is well browned. Then set meat chunks aside. Add the onions to the pot. Pull the pot halfway off the fire and cook the onions until they are soft and just starting to take on some golden color. Add the flour to or add the flour to the onions and stir until the flour smells nutty. Add in the wine and scrape any brown bits off the bottom of the pot. Bring the wine to a boil. Return the meat chunks to the pot along with carrots, garlic, and the bundle of herbs. Add in the stock and adjust the pot's location to maintain a gentle simmer. Let it cook for two to three hours or until the meat is fork tender. Keep an eye on the pot while it's cooking and skim away any scum that accumulates on the top of the wooden spoon. Once the meat is tender, remove the bundle of herbs and add the cured pork back to the stew. Serve in warm bowls with some crusty hunks of bread. Make sure to drink up the rest of the wine that was used in the cooking. So that is like... I mean, I don't know how many of you out there are are cooks or chefs or like to cook or peruse recipes or own cookbooks or any of that stuff. But if for some reason any of what I just mentioned you don't know anything about, this is painstakingly created but using fictional creatures. And then here you go at the bottom, spring in your step. Consuming this gif, or this gif, Jesus. <laughs> Consuming this dish gives you the bullet's uncanny jumping ability. For the first eight hours after eating, you may double the distance you leap in standing or running jump. So there's a cool ability that you get by eating this magical monster food. So that was a soup. We're not gonna do too much here. Skip past the sauce, the appetizers. We're gonna get to do an entree here. And then we'll uh, we'll see what we can get towards the bottom. Cobalt, Nothic, uh, Rothe, Sahugan. Sturge Subis. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know what? I don't actually feel like I think I need to go through all of the d ingredients for the Sturge, but we'll skip to this as an entree. So we'll just get to the last bit of what this gives you if you were to consume this Sturge-based meal. This dish makes your blood become toxic to most creatures who would want to feed on it. For eight hours after eating, any creature attempting to drain your blood must succeed on a DC-12 con save. On a failure, they are unable to feed on you with any of their abilities. So this works for Sturges, Vampires, things of that nature. Uh, death Kisses as well, uh, if you ever come across one of those. Hopefully you don't. But anyway, guys, that is the joy of monster cooking. I was not sure what to expect when I first heard about this, but I'm positively blown away. Now, whether or not you're gonna go to the painstaking detail to describe any or all of these uh, processes as you make this happen in your campaign as either a player or a dungeon master, but the fact that you have it here, that you can go back 
and get that someone did, that Lex and company did get to this level of detail to provide you this with background information, with a story about the chef and the cool thing if you manage to do it. I don't know. It just goes above and beyond what I expect from like a $1.95 module in the DMs Guild. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you do decide to pick it up, to leave a review or comment on the page to request possibly a Joy of Monster Cooking 2. There's a lot of cool stuff contained within this document, as you saw. And, you know, it's kind of a new kind of alchemical potion or whatever you, uh, or, you know, how you want to describe it for each food article written here. But something like this obviously takes time. So if you are requesting a second copy or, or another version of this, you know, a, a part two, volume two, uh, it's probably going to take a little while. There's a lot of writing that went into each one of these, painstakingly describing the ingredients, how they need to be prepared, and then the actual process for cooking said ingredients. Um... But yeah, I'm a huge fan. I would love to use these in my game. I don't know, or any of my games really, I don't know to what degree that would happen, but if I can make something an option for the players, I'm going to try to do so. But let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and I will see you guys for the next DMs Guild Spotlight video.